Today, we know it as the south of France. From the 9th century to the 13th centuries, this land was known as Occitania. Occitania stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Alps, and from the city of Limoges in the north to the Pyrenees and the Mediterranean Sea in the south. The cities of Bordeaux, Toulouse, and Marseille were within its borders. Occitania was never an independent kingdom. Rather, this region was united by a common culture and a common language, the language of Occitan. Occitan is a Romance language, more similar to Catalan than to modern-day French. Occitan was the language of the troubadours, the first lyric poets in the Western world. In the year 1209, northern French warlords joined forces with the Catholic Church to plunder the wealth and destroy the culture of Occitania. They succeeded. Even so, even today, we can still hear echoes of Occitan culture and echoes of the troubadours. I'm Rai, Rai Donneré, and I'm a medievalist. Today, we're on the trail of the troubadours. Off we go. We are at the Chateau de Las Tours, the four towers of Las Tours. Actually, originally in the Albigensian Crusade days, there were only three. One was built after the Crusade ended. But this one is the most important. This is the Castel de Cabaret, and its lord was Père Roger de Cabaret, who was a great warrior during the Albigensian Crusade. His wife, um, Loba de Pernotier, was a beauty, and several, several of the troubadours came to pay homage to her, to sing her songs. One of them, the most interesting story, is of Père Vidal. Père Vidal was known for his, his antics, his tricks, and he was in love with Loba, but he wasn't really making any impression on her. So what he decided to do was, since she was Loba, she was the feminine wolf, he decided to dress up as the masculine wolf. So he clothed himself in all of these furs and looking very wolf-like and started to make his way up the mountain towards Loba. Well, the problem was that he smelled so bad that all the, all the dogs and all the local peasants came and thought this was a real game, so they started beating him up. And he had to climb as fast as he possibly could up here and got in. He was tattered, he was bleeding, he's brought before Loba. And instead of being her valiant knight come to claim her, she's the one who's got to take care of him. <laughs> the troubadour started off with Gilhelm de Petus, who was um, the Duke of Poitou, and he was Eleanor of Aquitaine's grandfather. He had gone on a crusade to the Holy Land and he brought back Arabic musicians. So you have this whole Arabic influence coming in from the crusades as well as rising up over the Pyrenees. The troubadour was not just a singer, he was a composer and he was also a philosopher and a poet. He was not obliged to sing. He was not obliged to sing for his supper. This is not some kind of wandering minstrel going off in the land, but he would be invited to the castle to spend however much time there and to practice his craft or his art. Their work is the first expression of lyric poetry in the Western world, in the vernacular. Did the troubadour ever win the favors of the lady? Yes, apparently in some cases I think he did. Um, that's because the husband was possibly off fighting battles. Don't forget, you have this contractual marriage, so the husband and wife might like each other, but they're certainly not in love with each other. So the husband's doing his thing, and the lady, surreptitiously, is possibly doing her thing. And who more than a valiant troubadour who's coming to entertain the whole court? Of course, part of it was lusting after the ladies. Of course, some of the troubadours lusted after the ladies. It was not overt. It was, um, 
there would be allusions to it. The only person who was really overt was Kilhem de Petus when he says, I just can't wait to get my hands underneath her cloak. That's overt. But most of the later troubadours, he was the first troubadour, don't forget, but most of the later troubadours, they, it became more and more um, hidden. But the majority of, of it, really the whole concept behind this finamor, this refined, this pure love, was to purify yourself through love of another. Well, fin amour, it's more than sexuality. It's going beyond. You have to have love, okay? And, and love, yes, obviously, it's, it's physical love is, 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 part of, uh, is part of love. But also, it's, it's that transcendence to make yourself more perfect. It really is. It's the perfection of the, of the troubadour, the perfection of the man, but the perfection of the woman to transcend to a higher spiritual and moral level. Think about courtly love, basically. You have uh, these very stereotype, male and a very stereotype, female. It's not this, this unifying, um, it's not this unifying principle that you have with fin amor. It's, it just degenerates out in, into something else entirely. Some people think it's a continuation of a fin amor, but it's really not. It's, it's taking fin, fin amor and almost making a cartoon out of it. This book, The Art of Courtly Love, was it a parody? No, I don't think so. I think he was trying to actually write down some of what you're supposed to do. But here you've got the, this complete, complete crossroads between fin amour and between courtly love. Courtly love, you must pay, uh, grow pale when your lover appears. You must do this, you must do that. All this codification. No, that wasn't fin amour. Fin amour, fin amour is felt from the heart. Courtly love is helped felt from the head, and there's a damn big difference between those two. Loving someone else heals you, and it's only through loving someone else that you can really open up yourself and understand what loving God means, loving the divine. You can't, how can you love God if you can't love other people? How can you love God if you can't see her in all, everybody's eyes? The whole impetus of Fin Amor is this transcendence is this perfecting yourself to become a better person. And it was through loving someone, and it was only through loving someone that you could become a better person. You let your ego go. You put the other person before yourself. And that's how you transcend. Oh, I think the spiritual practice of the Cathars was love, that everything for them was love. People talk about uh, the Cathars having a, a good, good God of, who was immaterial and a bad God who was material. But again, it's such a simplistic philosophy for these people who were so incredibly sophisticated and intelligent. No, the bad God was the God inside, was the ego, because the war was going in on inside every person. So yes, there was a bad God and a good God, but the bad God was the ego. The good God was the conscience, the heart, what the heart was telling him. Really, with Fin Amor, you have the ideas of Cathar, it's, in, in, it's hidden in plain sight. I mean, you, there are certain scholars who go through every single line of a troubadour poem. You're not going to find it like that. You're going to find the whole thing in the concept of Fin Amor. You don't need anything else. Hey, it's right there in the song, the whole concept. Is, is transcendence. That's what Fin Amor is about. Transcendence through love, transcendence through the power of love. Through the power of love, we can change ourselves and we can change the world. The classical age of the troubadours goes from 1180 to 1220. I put it at 1210 because you've got the Albigensian Crusade starting in 1209. This is putting the entire Occitan into complete and utter turmoil. We're at the Castel de Pere Pertusa. Pere Pertusa was probably the most well-known of all the Cathar castles. This is built high, high on a rock. Pere Pertusa means pierced rock. The owner, Guilhelm de Pere Pertusa, did not submit to the Simon de Montfort and the Crusaders, and he was excommunicated. The castle hung out for as long as it possibly could, and only after the Albigensian Crusade 
was it finally delivered into the hands of the French. You see the bravery, you see the perseverance, you see the heart of the people who lived here in Occitania. Nothing could shake them, like this castle, nothing could shake it. Nothing could shake them. They were determined to do what they were going to do, which was to keep their, keep their society going, keep their society alive. It was a society where there was religious tolerance. Nowhere else was there religious tolerance. Here there was religious tolerance. Here there was gender equality. Here there was social mobility. They lived by their own rules, by the rules of Paracha, this tremendously strong ethic. Those are very much warrior ethics. You're going to kill them, you kill them on the battlefield, fair and square, but you're certainly not going to take them and hang them. That is against Parachi. That is against the code of honor. Parachi, it's a whole code of ethics. It's everything that was good about the society of Occitania. It was bravery, it was loyalty, it was honor, it was generosity, it was kindness, it was tolerance, and it was balance. Balance between the person and the world and balance within oneself. That is Parache. And there's just no, not one word to describe it. If you, if you followed Parache, then you had prets, you had worth, you had value. And if you said he or she has prets, you didn't need to say anything else about it because then that person obviously would follow Parache. Parache was endemic to the country. If it had a motto, it would have been Parache. Any part of your medieval society was constantly at war. It was a completely different ethic. That was the ethic of the times. The men fought wars. Think of the samurai. It's kind of a, a loose analogy, but there you go. It's a similar kind of thing. There's a code of ethics, and yet it's a warrior society. You have to remember, it was 800 years ago, 800, 900 years ago. So for its day, it was very enlightened, yes. And it was a damn sight better than anything else in Europe. And a long way to go up to 300 yards, so he could get the people down there. You see, the reason the English won at Agincourt was because they had the longbow. And these things just came absolutely flying over and decimated the French, because the French only could, could just go straight. They were in these lines of cavalry and just went straight. And they couldn't really turn side to side because they had those bloody great helmets on. Aquitaine, the whole of Aquitaine, belonged to England because, I mean, Eleanor of Aquitaine, she was married to Henry II of England. So all of Aquitaine was, um, was uh, under English rule. Uh, Richard the Lionheart hardly spoke any English. He spoke Occitan and he spoke Francian. So he didn't know any English. And certainly Richard would have had the longbow. So, and Richard knew a lot of people in the south of France. He sort of trundled around. So it's very possible that Guilhem de, de Perpetusa met Richard Zamora, certainly knew of his skill in battle and what was going on with the longbow. It was a perfect alignment. And with a, you know, 300 yards, boom, with the longbow straight down. Castle of Puyvert today. Puyvert was an amazing castle, still is an amazing castle, because it was here that the troubadours came every year to have their competition of music. This is not the original castle. The original castle actually is a tumble-down heap behind this one, but you still get the general idea of what it actually looked like. It was not a fortress. It could not withstand Simon de Montfort. Bernard de Congost, who was the owner of the castle, gave in after only two or three days to the crusading forces. But before then, it was a wonderful haven of music, tranquility and love. This was the place to be in the spring. Everyone wanted to come to Puyvert. It was the Woodstock of its day. In 1170, Eleanor of Aquitaine was here with possibly Richard the Lionheart, her son. And there was a competition at that time with various troubadours. The troubadours would come here to, to entertain, but also probably to, to meet each other, to renew their ties every year. The troubadours were in friendly competition. 
so they would be glad to see each other. This was a Cathar household, and it was also the place where all the troubadours reunited. You get this idea that the Cathars were terribly strict and austere, but here was a Cathar family putting on a music festival, so they were just as human as everybody else. They liked a good song. Puyvert was in the really in the center between two great castles, between Montségur and Perpétus. And so people would come here, I suppose, on their way from one to the other, and it was kind of an, an, an informal place. This is the Musée du Kerkorb, the Museum of Kerkorb, which is just down the road from the castle of Puyvert. And this is an extraordinary place because they have copies, or rather reproductions, of the medieval instruments. All of those instruments have been replicated with the help of experts, of musicians, of archaeologists, of technologists, and now they can actually be played. And you can see some of these have um, carvings of animals on them. One of the reasons was because some of the um, instruments were actually used during hunting, because the hunt was accompanied by music, which I didn't know about before. These animals are in a kind of a light mode, a very secular mode. This is the reconstitution of the cornemuse in the château de Puyvert. So there is a vingtaine of years, there is a model that was made in the museum et qui n'a pas été exploité depuis, qui est resté dans le, dans le musée. Et c'est le seul exemplaire au monde en circulation. Ah, wow. C'est euh, ouais. des clients simples, quoi. Mm -hmm. C'est des morceaux de roseau fendus dans le sens de la longueur. Mm -hmm. Donc ici, on a la partie mélodique mm -hmm. de la muse. Et ici, on a la partie bourdon avec un résonateur qui était fabriqué. Mm -hmm. voilà. Qui, au départ, les muses donc, ben, se jouaient comme ça. Hein. Se jouer donc euh, mm -hmm. à la bouche. Et après, donc, on a mis la, la muse au sac. Mm -hmm. Le terme cornemuse ne viendra qu'au XIVe siècle. Ah. Ouais, ouais, avec Guillaume de Machaut. Ah bon, avec Machaut, voilà. oui. Mais l'organologie de l'instrument mm -hmm. reste la même donc un porte-vent, mm -hmm. un tuyau quoi, avec euh, un clapet de cuir mm -hmm. ouais, qui gonfle la poche. En bloquant, en bloquant le, la partie mélodique de la, de la cornemuse, qu'on peut l'entendre, avoir que le bourdon de la cornemuse, ce qui permet de chanter mm -hmm. sur un bourdon avec une voix un peu comme la polyphonie. Mm -hmm. ah. la musique modale mm -hmm. et donc la principe de la, la polyphonie de, mm -hmm. de, 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 de l'organome l'organe la voix mm -hmm. donc euh, permet donc grâce à un petit bouchon ou à une technique mm -hmm. en bloquant la, la partie mélodique de la cornemuse mm -hmm. de n'avoir que le bourdon et donc de pouvoir chanter on consomme moins d'air mm -hmm. et on peut chanter dessus mm -hmm. c'est pour ça qu'aussi bien qu'à Reims et à Puyvert c'est les deux endroits où elles sont représentées sculptées le musicien n'est pas représenté mm -hmm. Les joues gonflées, mais comme ça. comme ça. Et pas les doigts levés, les doigts bouchés. Voilà. Voilà.
People are fighting, people are being besieged, people are getting burnt, people are getting their, undergoing torture, people are having their, their noses and their ears slit off. So I can't imagine that troubadours are going around writing love songs to women at that time. It's hard to think that. I think they may have been writing songs, but they were writing a different kind of song. Now, after, at the end of the Albigensian Crusade, and when you get the Inquisition coming along, then you get the really biting wit, and you get the sarcasm, and you get the incredibly anti-Roman polemic. But that's not what I would call the heart of Fina Moore. That's not your real classical troubadour music. After the Crusade did its work and, and basically knocked out the, the entire community of the Cathars, it was during the time of the Inquisition, around uh, 1230, 1235, I can't remember, even 1240, that a man was humming a troubadour melody on the streets of Toulouse and was hauled in by the Inquisition because obviously this was highly subversive. But one of the troubadours, um, well, several of them wrote really biting satire against the church and put them to a church chant or a church song, which <laughs> you don't get much more subversive than that. What we're looking at at the moment is the part of the island of Porquerolles, which are the Ile d'Or or Ile d'Hier, the islands of gold. In the 14th century, supposedly there was a hermitage here where the monk, who was known as the Mange des Îles d'Or, the monk of the Isles of Gold, came in the late summer and every autumn and wrote about the lives of the troubadours. He was a librarian at the monastery of Saint Honora. He found this biographical history of the troubadours in the library of Saint Honora. He describes who the troubadours were, where they came from, what, um, what they did and whom they loved. He'd probably be hearing the songs of the troubadours in his mind and would be listening to the, to the wind and the pines, to be hearing the seagull, because he came here during the time when the seagull were, were chirruping away. 
So this would be his time here. This would be what he would be hearing. Probably helping him to remember about the troubadours, thinking about how they sounded. Because by that time, the troubadours were long gone. <laughs>